Hello and welcome to the Alpine Calls video on how to prepare for the Tour du Mont Blanc. My name is Marvin Four, and I head up Alpine Calls, the official coaching and training partner to the Tour du Mont Blanc. At the moment I record this video, there's no way of knowing if the event will go ahead on July the 18th as planned. If you have any hope of riding it, however, you'll need to do some serious training. In this video, we go into the details of what it takes to finish this event and what your training should look like. And we also give some consideration to training during the global pandemic caused by the coronavirus. First, a very brief word about Alpine Coles, so you know who's talking to you. We're a team of cycling coaches living in the Alps, focused mainly on helping people to perform better at the big mountain sportives and grand fondos, events like the Marmot, the Haute Route, and of course the toughest of them all, the Tour du Mont Blanc. We're all qualified cycling coaches and keen riders ourselves, so we know from experience that doing well in these events is about a lot more than having a high FTP or being able to generate impressive numbers on Swift or on a turbo trainer. And we've seen time and time again how coaching makes a huge difference by accelerating the learning process. So let's take a look at the Tour du Mont Blanc. It's often referred to as the toughest one-day sportive in the world. It's a loop through three countries, France, Switzerland and Italy, around the highest mountain in Europe. The route covers 338 kilometers and includes 8,500 meters of climbing. These are huge numbers and you must not take this event lightly. I can't emphasize too much how tough it is and therefore how seriously you should take your preparation. One of our coaches, New Zealand and Silas Cullen, calls the event a marmot on steroids. Just for the anecdote, he finished the Tour du Mont Blanc in 2013 in the remarkable time of 13 hours and 46 minutes in spite of being unsupported in what were absolutely atrocious conditions and on top of that having to repair two punctures on the way. I tell you, these Kiwis are tough. You're going to take somewhere between 12 and 19 hours to finish the Tour du Mont Blanc assuming you do manage to finish. If you do, you can be proud of yourself. You'll be amongst the select few who have found the physical and mental endurance to cycle around Europe's highest mountain in one day. And if you're not just a little apprehensive at the thought of riding 338 kilometers and climbing 8,500 meters in the same ride, you're either an extremely accomplished ultra-distance cyclist or you haven't thought about it for long enough. In a good year, the attrition rate is around 40%. It's better not to ask how high it is when the weather is bad. Everybody starts in the dark at 5 a.m. And unlike this gentleman in the photo, many will finish after nightfall, perhaps having to do the descent from the Cormier de Roselin in the dark, as well as the final climb. The event is above all an endurance challenge. And although all participants are timed, there's no official classification and all finishers receive a medal and a well-deserved gold certificate. It's really a challenge on three levels, mental, physical and nutritional, and in that order. Being physically unfit or failing to eat and drink enough will sabotage your ride as effectively as a catastrophic mechanical failure, but the most likely reason to abandon is mental. Chances are it's the toughest thing you've ever done, by some margin. And at the halfway point, you'll have ridden almost the equivalent of the marmot, but it's still only halfway. To reach the finish, you'll push yourself to your limits and then have to dig deeper still and go beyond those limits. You'll experience extraordinary highs and lows and moments of euphoria where you can't believe how strong you feel, followed by moments of despair when you can't believe how weak you feel. To use the old cliche, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Most participants think of quitting many times. Those who have prepared properly can usually find the tenacity and determination they need to keep going. Just to complete the somber picture here, the weather is a major imponderable on the Tour du Mont Blanc and it can turn an extremely tough event into a terrible ordeal if you are unprepared or if you lack the right clothes. Most people would probably agree that heavy rain is the worst, 
but for some the extreme heat sometimes experienced in Italy can be as much of a challenge. Be aware that even if it doesn't rain, you can expect to experience temperatures varying from close to zero degrees on the three highest passes to as much as 35 degrees at the lowest point in Italy. That's a huge variation in temperature that you need to manage and it requires careful planning and the right equipment, especially if you don't have a dedicated sport support team. Now, before we get into the details of the training plan, we first need to take a look at the actual demands of the event, or in other words, what does it take to do well? We've broken these down into three different categories, physiological, psychological, and technical. Looking at the physiological first, the first and by far the most important is that you'll need quite exceptional aerobic endurance. Whether you're riding for 12 hours or 20 hours, it's an aerobic event. During the tour, you shouldn't be spending any time at all close to your threshold, let alone above it. So this is the key point. Your main training goal is to increase the amount of time for which you can ride at a steady endurance pace. The second physiological demand is for a high power to weight ratio because of the massive amount of climbing. For many riders, it will be just as important to lose weight as to try to increase power. The final physiological demand is the ability to recover quickly after a long climb. You will of course have to descend as much as you climb, but the descents are much faster so you'll typically have less than 30 minutes or so to recover between each of the long climbs. This puts a premium on the ability to recover quickly. The Tour du Mont Blanc is as much a mental challenge as a physical one, so the psychological demands are particularly important. The first is an ability to stay positive throughout and deal with the inevitable setbacks and negative thoughts that will hit you from time to time, especially in the third quarter of the event on the Col du Petit Saint Bernard, which seems to go on forever and ever. It's easier to stay positive for some than for others. If you're one of life, life's pessimists or a glass half empty type of person, it's harder. Nevertheless, there are plenty of tools and mental strategies that can help. Read our article in the performance tips section of the blog on our website. The second psychological demand is for the ability to maintain focus, concentration and lucidity throughout a very long day, especially as you get more and more tired. Losing concentration when descending off the Corme de Rosalind at high speed in the dark doesn't bear thinking about, for example. You can develop your ability to concentrate for hours on end during long training rides. Finally, it's crucial to have the self-discipline and the self-awareness to stick to the plan. Decide in advance what pace you're going to ride the climbs at, and how often and how much you're going to eat and drink, and don't get tempted to do things differently. Both euphoria and despair are bad advisors, just like triumph and disaster. Let's look now at the technical demands of the event. It's a given that you need excellent climbing skills, but what does that mean? The challenge here is not to smash it up one climb, but it's to keep climbing all day at a sustainable pace. To do this, you need the ability to climb economically, both seated and standing, with a perfectly fluid pedal, pedal stroke and no wasted energy. What goes up must come down, so someone with the ability to descend at 80 to 90 kilometers per hour will have a huge advantage over someone who is limited to 50 or 60. The nice thing about learning to descend is that the speed is free. There's no energy cost. Another key technical demand is the ability to refuel yourself. You're going to expend somewhere between eight and 12,000 calories getting around the mountain. You need to replace as many of these as possible whilst you are riding, and this is much more challenging to get right than it might appear. You'll also have to replace the salts you lose by sweating and drink 10 to 12 bottles of fluid, perhaps more if it is a hot day. All of that takes training and practice. The final technical demand is to manage wide variations in the temperature. You don't want to be wearing the same clothes at zero degrees on the summit and at 30 degrees at the start of the next climb. A following car obviously makes this easier, but the key is to have multiple layers that you can adjust on the fly. This takes practice and experience to get right. Ideally, you want to be able to make these adjustments while you're riding 
so you don't lose time unnecessarily. Now we're clear about what it takes to do well at the Tour du Mont Blanc, we can look at how to prepare for it. It's important to understand there's no such thing as a standard training plan for the Tour du Mont Blanc that will work for everybody. A training plan is always designed with a specific event and a specific rider profile in mind because what works for one rider and one event won't necessarily work for another rider or even for the same rider at another event. The training guidelines we give here are quite different from those we would give for the Marmot or for the Etape du Tour. The best training plan for you is one that has been designed with your personal goals, your unique strengths, your limiters, your experience, your context, and your constraints in mind. And on top of that, it's constantly adapted for you as and when things change. For all these reasons, we're not providing a detailed day-to-day -day training plan. What we are providing is a framework and a set of guidelines for you to adapt to your own unique circumstances. Our goal is to give you the means to think carefully about the process and to take responsibility for your own preparation. So let's take a look at the principles on which you need to build your training plan. The first is obviously that it's got to be tailored for you. Secondly, the whole point of this plan is to build the strongest possible aerobic engine. To do this, you need to do as much as possible long, slow distance. Forget sprint intervals, VO2 max, and even sweet spot training. They're of very little help in preparing for a 17-hour ride through the mountains. The next principle is to increase the load progressively and then give yourself time to recover. Training actually makes you weaker because you're breaking your body down, so in fact you get stronger when you're recovering, not when you're training. If you keep ramping up the training, making it harder and harder, sooner or later you'll get into a situation where you've overtrained, your body shuts down and forces you to stop and you'll be worse off than you were in the beginning. It's also extremely dangerous, of course, in the present time with the coronavirus uh, because it reduces your immune system and will make you much more susceptible to get sick. Finally, make sure you work on your limiters and technical skills. So let's take the example of descending. If this is a limiter for you, as it is for many people who don't live in the mountains, then you could easily lose as much as 10 minutes on each descent and that will add up to as much as an hour and a half by the end, which is really a shame, because descending fast is a skill that has almost no energy cost, and with good coaching, it's easy to learn. Here's the basic training framework that we recommend. You can download this framework from either the official Tour du Mont Blanc website, or from the performance tips section of the blog on the Alpine Coles website. The plan is structured into three macro cycles or phases. Preparation, which lasts until the middle of April. Then pre-competition, which lasts until the beginning of July. And finally, the competition or taper phase, which covers the last two to three weeks before the tour itself. Each of these phases is then broken down into what coaches like to call mesocycles, which are simply four-week cycles where the training load varies. The idea is to load it up through the first three weeks and then to take a week of recovery. The result is that the training load varies in a sawtooth fashion, as you can see uh, on the right of the screen. If you're over 50 years old, you might want to consider three-week cycles instead of four weeks. This is because from about 50 on, it takes longer and longer to recover, and research has shown that a three-week cycle can be more effective. The volume here on this chart is measured in arbitrary units, 1 to 5. You can choose to measure your training volume in training hours, or training stress score, or trimp points, or suffer score, or whatever is most convenient for you. All these measures have their advantages and disadvantages that we won't go into here. In terms of weekly training hours, we suggest that a good target would be to build towards 10 to 15 hours per week during the preparation phase, and then increase that progressively towards 15 to 20 hours per week during the pre-competition phase. Finally, the last two to three weeks in the tapering competition phase are where you should reduce the load by about 50% so you can arrive at the event itself fresh but without having lost any fitness. 
So how do you customize this framework for yourself? It's best to be pragmatic and start with your constraints, especially training time availability. Be realistic here. Confirming it with your partner and family might save a lot of misunderstandings and arguments. Which days of the week can you train and for how long? What are the family or work commitments that will prevent you from training on certain days or weeks? Once you've thought this through, you can block off, week by week, the training time you'll have available. You'll probably end up with something that's quite a long way away from ideal, but that can't be helped. Adjust things as much as you can to respect the principles of increasing the training load followed by recovery in three or four week cycles. Again, it's really important to respect those cycles and make sure you have some clear off weeks where you recover and rebuild. Now you know how much training time you have available, week by week, there are just two more questions before getting into the detail. The first concerns your objectives. Is your focus 100% on the Tour du Mont Blanc, or do you need to take other important objectives into account? To keep things simple and focused, we will assume your focus is 100% on the TMB. The second question concerns your strengths and limiters compared to the event demands. What are the physiological or psychological qualities and technical skills that you most need to develop? Over the next few slides, we're going to talk about the details of the training. First of all, for the preparation phase between January and mid-April, the number one objective is to develop your aerobic endurance. And at least 80% of your training time should be focused on this which means a lot of long, relatively slow rides. If you normally go out and try and ride as hard as you can for two or three hours, and your measure of success is your performance on Strava segments, I'd strongly suggest that you should think about training differently for the Tour du Mont Blanc. What you need to learn is how to ride for 16 to 18 hours through the mountains. There's no way you can do that full gas. Nobody can. It's physiologically impossible. The only way you'll finish the Tour du Mont Blanc is by learning to ride slowly for a long time. Whatever your typical duration of training rides is now, you need to start building it up and aim to get it to at least 6 hours, if not 8 or even 10 hours by mid-April and the end of this phase. The ride should be at endurance pace from start to finish. If you use a power meter or a heart rate monitor and you know your zones, you should be in zones 1 or 2, the active recovery and endurance zones. For the technically minded, this means staying below LT1, the point at which lactate, thre l sorry, l the point at which lactate levels in your blood first start to rise. If you don't use either power or heart rate, you'll have to ride on feel. Riding in zone 1 feels very easy, no effort at all. Riding in zone 2 also feels easy, at least for the first couple of hours, but it feels progressively harder as you push out to 3, 4, 5, 6, and then later 10 or 12 hours. A good indicator of whether you're in zone 2 or not is, can you talk? You should be able to hold a proper conversation without gasping for breath. The second physiological quality you need to develop is your power-to-weight ratio. Looking at the power side of this, you should plan around 10% of your training time to include intervals to build your leg strength. In the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you a couple of example interval sessions which will work well for this. But first, a quick word on weight, the other side of the power to weight uh, ratio. Don't get obsess obsessive about your weight, but still, most of us could probably benefit from losing a couple of kilos. The best advice I can give here is to adjust your calorie intake to your training load so that you eat more on days when you're training hard and less on your rest days. And aim to take the weight off slowly. Don't try and take it all off in the first month. Be realistic about it and take a gradual progressive approach. This first set of intervals is intended to build leg strength and to improve your pedal stroke. I did them on the road, but of course you could also do them on a turbo trainer if you don't have a convenient hill. The first line on the chart, the yellow line is power, the red line is heart rate, the blue line is cadence, and the red stack bars represent the slope. 
So you can see I did three hill repeats. In order to work on leg strength, you need to push hard so the cadence must be low. And I did these particular intervals at an average cadence of 50 RPM. A word of warning here, it is important to have a good bike fit to do intervals like these because pushing hard for so long will create injuries if something is not right. You shouldn't feel any pain in your knees or lower back. If you do, it's a sign that something's not right. The idea is to keep your power and cadence steady at a tempo pace around the crossover point between zone 3 and zone 4, so at about 85% of your FTP or your critical power. Focus on your pedal stroke to keep it as smooth as possible, pulling back through the bottom, lifting the upcoming leg and pushing forward over the top. When I did this, my heart rate climbed steadily and peaked at 134 beats per minute, which is in the middle of my zone 3. So it's very much a tempo exercise, and the last few minutes felt about 16 out of 20 on the rate of perceived exertion scale. Here's a second set of intervals which will also build leg strength, but at the same time will give you a higher cardio workout. This particular set was done on a turbo, but you can do it on the road if you have a suitable hill with a steady gradient and no traffic. There are five 15-minute threshold efforts with a five-minute break in between, so it adds up to a total of one hour 15 at threshold. I held the power constant at my current FTP critical power and my cadence at 60 RPM. My heart rate climbed steadily and then peaked as you would expect at my threshold heart rate number, which for me is around 146 beats per minute. In terms of how did it feel, this is a tough workout. It actually took me a couple of months to build up to managing five sets. The last set, and especially the last five few minutes, were extremely hard, and I was only just able to finish by using every mental strategy I know to keep turning the pedals. It's a great workout for building strength for long climbs, and it's a good thing to do at this time of year. Those two interval sessions I just showed you are examples of what we think works well for the Tour du Mont Blanc. There are plenty of alternative interval designs out there. The main point is to know why you are choosing one session over another. There's little point, for example, in doing very short, high-intensity intervals because these develop a quality you won't need on the Tour du Mont Blanc. So with that, we've covered 90% of your training. You should spend the remaining 10% on active recovery meaning quite short and very easy rides in Zone 1. Throughout this period you'll be doing a lot of long endurance rides, so take advantage of them to work on your technical skills as well as to test different options for equipment and nutrition hydration. The technical skills I have in mind include things like nice fluid pedaling, pedaling at high cadence, pedaling standing up on long climbs, cornering, descending, eating and drinking, and also adjusting your clothing while riding as the temperature changes. You should test any equipment that you might use on the tour well in advance, whether it's something you're going to wear or something on your bike. You don't want to find out halfway around Mont Blanc that your new helmet or new shoes become intolerably uncomfortable after eight hours, or that the new lights you bought especially for the tour don't work as expected. Equally for nutrition, what works for a 5-6 to six hour sportive probably won't scale up to the Tour du Mont Blanc. Since you'll be riding at a lower intensity, gels may not be the best choice and you'll soon get sick of them. Try out different things which appeal to you, such as different brands of energy bars or honey waffles, as well as homemade options like flapjacks, rice cakes, sandwiches or dried fruit. It's a good idea to have some savoury options available as well, as most riders find there comes a time when they can't take anything more that's sweet. The same thing goes for your choice of hydration. You can't just drink water or else you'll lose too many salts. So you need to find a hydration mix that works for you and doesn't upset your stomach. Again, testing is really important so that you don't have a problem on the big day. Equally for nutrition, what works for a 5-6 to six hour sportive probably won't scale up to the Tour du Mont Blanc. Since you'll be riding at a lower intensity, gels may not be the best choice and you'll soon get sick of them. 
Try out different things which appeal to you, such as different brands of energy bars or honey waffles, as well as homemade options like flapjacks, rice cakes, sandwiches, or dried fruit. It's a good idea to have some savoury options available as well, as most riders find there comes a time when they can't take anything more that's sweet. The same thing goes for your choice of hydration. You can't just drink water, or else you'll lose too many salts. So you need to find a hydration mix that works for you and doesn't upset your stomach. Again, testing is really important so that you don't have a problem on the big day. That was for the on-the-bike training. Now there's another aspect that many amateurs neglect, which is the possibility to improve your performance by off-the-bike exercises. The first part of that is strength and conditioning. Increasing the strength of your leg muscles and your core abdominal muscles is the most effective way to increase your power and your climbing endurance. And you can do this more easily in the gym than on the bike. Additionally, cycling creates a lot of muscle imbalances which can only be reduced by doing the appropriate exercises off the bike. I strongly recommend you see a specialist to get help with strength and conditioning, but as this is not the time to be going to public gyms, I prefer to point you to the British Cycling website, which is a great source for uh, uh, exercises in, of this type. The second part of the off the bike exercises is flexibility and stretching. This is important to maintain your full range of flexibility and to prevent issues such as lower back pain, which is often caused by tight hamstrings and hip flexors. Again, do seek specialist help. I personally find Pilates to be very useful. Yoga is an alternative, but in every case, make sure you get specialist help from someone who understands cycling. The details of each movement are critical, and it's very easy to make a mistake leading to injury. Believe me, I'm speaking from personal experience. Finally, other physical activities. There's nothing wrong with including other physical activities in your plan, so long as they're endurance-based. This might be a great way to spend time with your partner and family to compensate for the long hours on the bike. Good choices include swimming and walking, perhaps running, but only if you already run regularly, otherwise you risk uh, injury. At the time I speak, it is currently against the law to cycle outside in many countries in Europe. This is obviously extremely frustrating to most of us, but it can't be helped. So, let's try to turn it round and see it as an opportunity. Depending on your personal situation, you may even be able to come out of this even stronger than had you continued as normal. Let me just pause here a moment to acknowledge the incredible work being done by all who work in healthcare, the emergency services, the police, in government administration, and in other roles in which you find yourself working very, very hard under extremely difficult circumstances, in some cases literally risking your life for the rest of us. We are deeply grateful for all you're doing. Now, for the people who are confined at home with time on their hands, there's no choice but to use your turbo or a set of rollers. Here are some guidelines to make the most of this opportunity. If you want to come out of this stronger, the first point is to stay polarized and to keep 80 to 90% of your training below VT1. Don't fall into the trap of making every session a race or a sweet spot session on Swift. If you do that, you'll perhaps feel good and you'll keep a certain level of fitness, that's for sure, but you will not progress. So how to stay sane at endurance pace on a turbo? The answer is to add variety. Do some sessions in Z1, Zone 1, active recovery, some at low zone 2, endurance, and some at high zone 2. But be strict about this. Keep your power and or your heart rate in a narrow range. And of course, below VT1, which is the top of zone 2. Try varying the cadence. Do this on a regular pattern so you're obliged to concentrate. For example, every two minutes switch between 70, 85 and 100 RPM while keeping the power constant. Every two weeks, you might do a pure cadence session at very low intensity where you improve your ability to spin fast. You can do a ramp such as five minutes at 95 RPM, four minutes at 100, three minutes at 105, two minutes at 110, 
and the last minute as fast as possible. Repeat this three times, and as you improve over time, you can start at a higher rate. For example, start at 100 or even at 105. All these turbo sessions are a great opportunity to improve your pedal strength. You're not having to focus on the road, so you can focus internally on what you're actually doing. Focus on keeping your pedaling as fluid and circular as possible. If you have a decent power meter, look at the torque efficiency numbers and try to push them to 100%. This is also a great opportunity to learn to ride on rollers. It's much more dynamic than a turbo and excellent for your balance. Next, if you do respect the polarized approach, you'll be in great shape to really smash the HIT sessions and get the most out of them. That's the whole point of polarized. Last, but definitely not least, this is a great opportunity to do a lot more off the bike strength and conditioning and really build your strength. You don't need a gym. There are dozens of exercises you can do with just body weight, such as planks, Bulgarian squats, sitting against the wall, and hundreds of others. It's a good idea to set yourself some targets. For example, if you can currently plank for 90 seconds, try to reach 3 minutes. If you can manage 10 Bulgarian squats, aim at reaching 20 in a month's time. Finally, mix things up a bit to keep them interesting. Why not mix your strength and conditioning sessions with easy spinning on the turbo? alternating every 15 minutes, for example. The key message here is there are so many different things you can do. Just keep, keep varying it, keep changing it, keep mixing it up, but do stick below VT1 in that endurance zone for 90% of your work. Keep it interesting, play some music, have fun, and uh, you, you'll come out of this stronger than if, you just, if you'd been riding on the road as you, as you would have done normally. Now we come to the pre-competition phase, which covers the period from mid-April until the end of June. The key objective during this phase is to bring your aerobic endurance to the highest possible level. So let's look at that in detail. The aerobic endurance will be 90% of your training time, and building this means continuing doing long rides in Zone 2, progressing to a 10-hour ride by the middle of June with as much climbing as possible. These long rides are exhausting which means you can't attempt too many. We recommend doing no more than two per week, ideally back to back on the weekend, and then just a couple of short recovery rides midweek. You'll probably have to do the long rides on your own because club rides are typically too short and too intense. The important thing is to keep the training low intensity and not to go above zone two in order to limit the fatigue. Assuming the Tour du Mont Blanc is, the, is your main priority, we don't recommend doing any high-intensity interval training during the pre-competition phase. The reason is that given the pure endurance nature of the Tour du Mont Blanc, high-intensity intervals will create too much fatigue for too little benefit. The recovery rides need to be short, no more than 60 to 90 minutes, and strictly in Zone 1. It's really important to make the recovery rides and the recovery weeks easy in order to give yourself time to recover and rebuild and avoid the risk of overtraining. Overtraining is particularly dangerous at the present time due to its effect on your immune system. Continue working on your technical skills and continue testing different equipment and nutrition hydration choices so that come July 18th you know exactly what works. If you don't have the chance to train regularly in the mountains, you should very seriously consider a training camp if, if, um, if, if the sanitary situation allows us to travel at that time, of course. Obviously, there are several different options out there, each with their advantages and disadvantages. If you choose to come with us, you'll not only get a big block of riding in the mountains, you'll also benefit from professional coaching and a real focus on improving your performance. You'll get specific feedback on your strengths and weaknesses and dozens of tips on all aspects of performance at Le Tour du Mont Blanc. You can get in touch with us through the email address here, info at alpinecoles.com. Also, during the pre-competition phase, you should continue with some off-the-bike work. 
We don't recommend continuing strength and conditioning due to the extra fatigue. We'd rather see you add an extra hour or two to your long rides. On the other hand, the flexibility and stretching sessions are even more important than they were in the previous phase. It's vital to maintain these sessions to keep your body flexible and prevent injuries. A good target to aim for is two of these flexibility and stretching sessions per week. Keep up other physical activities too, not only to spend time with your partner and family, but also to give your body the chance to move in other ways than just on the bike. You can do anything that keeps you moving without increasing your fatigue. At a more general level, it's really important to maximize your sleep and to sleep well. This is essential for recovery and adaptation, most of which takes place at night. Aim at a minimum of eight hours per night and try to wake up naturally without an alarm clock. A good tip is to banish all screens from the bedroom. I find that if I do take a screen to bed, it definitely impacts my sleep quality. Eating well is even more important than usual due to the high training load. This is not the place for extensive advice on nutrition, but the key principles are straightforward. Avoid industrial foods and supplements, unless you are taking the supplements under medical advice, and eat the widest possible variety of natural foods. Try to avoid alcohol. It's another stressor on your body that will impact your ability to train and sleep well. In a social situation where you either can't or don't want to avoid it, the best option is to copy the French and drink small amounts of the best quality wine you can find. Finally, and this advice applies with or without the coronavirus, try to minimize travel and any stress on your life. The more you can avoid adding stress to your body, the better off you will be in terms of performance in your training. The final phase is the taper, leading up to the competition, and this covers the final two or three weeks before the event. The key objective is to eliminate fatigue without losing fitness, so that you arrive on the start line the fittest you've ever been, but also super fresh and thus able to go the distance. Don't be tempted to keep training hard up to the last minute. The extra training will only build fatigue because your body won't have time to benefit from it by adapting and rebuilding. To decide for how long and how deeply to taper, pay careful attention to how you feel in the last three weeks of the pre-competition phase. If you're quite young and you feel great, the taper could be as short as 10 days. If you're a bit older and feel exhausted, you'll need to lengthen it. As a general guideline, we recommend tapering a minimum of 14 days for the Tour du Mont Blanc. So how to do it? Well, progressively reduce your training volume by about 50%. For example, if on the weekend of 27 to 28 June you do your final long rides, totaling 15 or 16 hours over two days, then you might do a couple of one-hour recovery rides midweek, and then just 10 hours in two rides over the weekend of the 4th to 5th of July, further couple of recovery rides during the week, and then no more than six to seven hours total in two rides, on the final weekend, which would be uh, the 11th to 12th of July. Ideally, you should arrive in Les Césies at least three days before the start. Do a couple of short rides to spin your legs, but nothing too strenuous. Let's not neglect the off-the-bike activities in this taper phase. It's really important to keep moving and keep stretching during this whole period while letting your body rest and recover from the accumulated long rides. The need for sleep, good quality nutrition, and minimum stress are even more acute during the taper. The advice is the same as for the pre-competition phase. The better you can plan to sleep well, eat well, and avoid stress, the better off you'll be. Sadly, it's best to cut the alcohol out completely during the taper, but of course you can look forward to making up for that once you cross the finishing line. Now, a few words about the current health situation. Firstly, I cannot encourage you too much to follow all public health recommendations and restrictions which may be announced. Secondly, please train responsibly. One, to break the chain of infection, we have to reduce the amount of interaction between people. This means staying at home. Cycling is currently banned in France, Italy, Spain and Belgium and will likely be banned very soon in many other countries. 
Use your turbo instead, even for low intensity training, and do a lot more off the bike strength and conditioning work. Two, if cycling is still permitted where you are, you may still choose to ride out, obviously, but don't take any risks. If you have an accident, the emergency services may not be able to take care of you, and the hospital is the last place where you want to be at the moment. Finally, be very careful not to overtrain. Doing so will depress your immune system and make it much more likely that you will catch the virus. So follow our recommendations and you should find yourself in great condition for a good ride at the Tour du Mont Blanc. I hope you found this presentation useful. Here are a few more resources to help you prepare for and perform well at the Tour. First, the performance tips section of the blog on the Alpine Coles website, where you'll find articles in both English and French on training guidelines and on building mental strength for the Tour du Mont Blanc. Over the next four months, we'll be adding additional articles on other aspects of performance. And all of these articles are also available on the official uh, Tour du Mont Blanc website itself. Secondly, throughout this presentation, I've tried to make it clear that we're all individuals and we need our own unique training plans. If you would like me or one of our other coaches to support you with your own plan, contact us and let's have a chat. Finally, don't underestimate the benefits of a training camp in the mountains a month before the event. We'd love to have you join us, but in order to ensure high quality coaching, places are limited so it's best to contact us without delay. Thank you for listening. Assuming the Tour du Mont Blanc does go ahead in 2020, we will be in the event village on July the 17th, so do please come and see us when you check in. In the meantime, this is Marvin Four from Alpine Coles wishing you good luck with your training, and above all, stay healthy, stay safe.